Okay, so my name is Caitlin Dorward. I am the Senior Research Associate at the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. And as Wayne said, I'm going to talk today about the work that we do at the Institute uh, in applied research and extension uh, and our role, what we see as the role of applied research to support food policy entrepreneurs and food policy uh, actors. So a bit of background first about where I'm coming from. So the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems is an applied research and extension unit at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. We're based in Richmond, British Columbia, so that's just south of Vancouver, down in the lower mainland of BC. And we focus exclusively on sustainable agriculture and local food systems in the work that we do. Our BC context, uh, a lot of the issues that we're facing are similar to what is going on in Alberta and around the world. There's some unique aspects though. Uh, so BC has a limited amount of prime agricultural land. Uh, lucky for us, it's, a lot of it is protected by a pretty strong provincial zoning designation called the Agricultural Land Reserve. And a lot of that land is in really close proximity to some of our big urban centers. And in those, there's a growing local food movement. A lot of our citizens really interested in buying local food, supporting local farmers. Uh, in the, despite all that, there are still, we face a lot of sustainability challenges that everyone in this room is familiar with uh, related to the food system, environmental, social, economic challenges, rising food insecurity in BC. We're the only province in Canada that doesn't have a poverty reduction strategy, not, not something really to be proud of. Uh, there's a crisis in farmland prices, real estate prices across BC, and it's a huge barrier for new entrants to farming. Our uh, province, this would be a threat to the growth of the local food system is that the province has largely been focused on a commodity export oriented uh, policy regime up until now. That's starting to change as more municipal governments and citizens are taking interest in uh, localizing of the food system. And sort of going along with that, we've lost a lot of our capacity for processing and distribution of food for local markets. So this context, it, essentially there's, there's a, a lot of sustainability challenges that we're facing, and in the face of those, a, a growing interest in localization of the food system. But there's a data gap that we see, and a lot of uh, our stakeholders come to us. There's a little real information on the potential of local food systems to contribute meaningfully to these sustainability challenges that we're facing. So there's a lot of speculation around what a local food system can achieve, and how the outcomes of a local food system would really compare to those of the food system that we have currently. So all of this informs the work that we do. So we conduct applied research and extension with and for what I'd call policy actors. So by this I mean policy makers. So we work primarily with uh, regional, municipal and First Nations governments. And then also the policy sort of takers or advocates, so community organizations and farmers, the people who are either pushing for policy change or on the receiving end of policy changes that are coming down from our governments. And our goal in doing this work is to provide data-driven information to the people that are making change in our food systems so that they can be making change that's informed uh, with uh, data fact, uh, factual information. So what I'm going to do now is just talk a little bit about some of the various projects that we work on and show you how our relationship with various policy actors uh, plays out um, in some of these real tangible projects, uh, applied research and extension projects. So first, our applied research. So I'll go back, start, start with a project that I uh, worked on when I first joined the Institute in 2010. And we had just been approached by one of the municipal governments in uh, neighboring Surrey, BC. And they were interested in knowing uh, if a food production and economic case could be made for getting a lot of their underused uh, agricultural land back in production. So this is a large municipality in the lower mainland where a third of their land base is in, uh, is in the ALR, the Agricultural Land Reserve, but a lot of it is not currently farmed. So we conducted a study with, with the city of Surrey. We looked at all of their underutilized agricultural land. There were over 3,000 acres of it, just within the municipal boundaries. And we found that if it was brought into production in small-scale agriculture that targeted local markets through direct marketing, it could satisfy up to 100% of Surrey's demand for 27 crops and livestock products for six months of the year. It could create over 1,200 full-time equivalent jobs and generate up to $73 million. 
So real uh, food production, job creation, and economic opportunities that uh, we were able to demonstrate to the city of Surrey and really highlight to them the importance of getting this land into production. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do that, so it's still an ongoing challenge for the municipality to figure out what policy levers they can use to get the land into production. Uh, one thing they're actually just about to launch is a land linking program that will connect the owners of uh, farmland that, who are not farming their land with new farmers who are looking for land to farm. So building on this uh, Surrey project that we did, uh, we looked a bit more regionally. We're hearing from a lot of the local governments in the southwest sort of mainland corner of BC and the citizens who live there that they're interested in what the potential of a localized food system within at that regional scale could accomplish. So we looked at this southwest mainland corner, we refer to this as the southwest BC bioregion. And we developed a computational model that compared southwest BC's current food system outcomes to a whole range of what-if scenarios for the year 2050, when the region's expected to have a 60% growth in population. So we said, what could the food system outcomes be if we localize the food system within this region in terms of food self-reliance, ecological indicators, and a number of economic indicators? We found that by localizing the food system, uh, so producing more food to satisfy local food need rather than export markets, in the year 2050, we could increase total food production by 93% compared to what we had in 2011. This would increase total food self-reliance by 42%. That's even with population growth. And we could almost double the economic magnitude of the food system by specifically by targeting the local food need of the population there. So these, this study, this is a four-year study that we've literally just wrapped up. We spent the last month sharing these results with the, uh, I believe it's 23 municipal and regional district governments that endorsed the project. And they're really interested in seeing this data, these hard numbers, that they can now turn around and use this to inform things like their official community plans, their agricultural area strategies, and their food system plans and other policies. So taking it more to a real, real policy uh, project that we've worked on, and this is uh, something that we're about to launch in the next couple months. So we heard from all types of food policy actors that not all policymakers, I would say most policymakers, are not local food system experts. And on the other side, we have a lot of food system advocates who aren't policy experts. So we're talking different languages, and there's a lot of reinventing the wheel taking place. So in response to this, we have just surveyed uh, the food, food and uh, local food and agriculture policies that are used, implemented by uh, municipalities across BC. We've cataloged them into a database that will be housed on our website. This is just a screenshot from the landing page. So this will be a searchable, centralized resource where policymakers, food system advocates, can search for policy precedents for poli when they're looking for policy change in their community. So if you're looking for an urban chicken bylaw, you can look in there and find out, oh, the city of Vancouver has an urban chicken bylaw, and maybe when I approach my counselor about this, I can bring the policy language to them. Um, so the ra it ranges from things, specific policies like an urban chicken bylaw all the way up to uh, context statements in official community plans. And then a current project we're working on is a, a feasibility study um, in partnership with a regional government who asked, uh, could urban agriculture help them unlock the potential of uh, unused land in their utility corridors to contribute to complete communities? So communities where people can live, work and play without having to leave. So we've partnered with this regional district government and a, a municipality within the region, the city of Langley, and we're looking at a 20-acre parcel of land that's currently locked up in a hydro right-of-way and conducting a study looking at the feasibility of having an urban agriculture food systems community hub on that piece of land. And the regional district is interested in this as a, a pilot and something that could potentially be applied across the region in other similar land areas. And I'll talk about just two examples of the extension work that we do. And by extension, I mean the dissemination of our research results out to the community, to people that can actually use that information. So our sort of flag flagship extension project is a partnership with the Tuasin First Nation that are uh, they're near Delta, BC, which is just south of Vancouver. 
So they approached us saying, you know, we support local food production, we're looking for job creation opportunities, and we want to steward our agricultural land that's located on our traditional territories. So we worked with the First Nation to establish a farm and a farm school on a 20-acre parcel of land on their traditional territory. So the farm, grow, we have a market garden, an orchard, we raise pigs and chickens, and we also have a, a nine-month adult education program in small-scale organic agriculture that takes place on the farm, and there are also incubator plots for graduates of the program to launch their own farm businesses. And then finally, uh, just ways that we, as research with research, researchers within the institute, try to lend our expertise outside our organization. So a number of us sit on various boards or committees. I personally, I co-chair the Vancouver Food Policy Council. The director of our institute sits on an agricultural advisory committee within our region. We also do a lot of talks and workshops for the public around food system issues. I teach canning workshops, it's just because it's a sort of personal passion of mine. So we try to get out there and share our knowledge, not just through the reports and studies that we write, but with other groups that are active in food systems as well. So just in conclusion, um, I guess overall, what I, I really want to send the message that as researchers, we think that we need to work together for food system change. Uh, for us, the keys to success are building relationships with our stakeholders, those policy actors that I mentioned earlier, listening to what the concerns are, what the information is that they need, and responding. And building those relationships is really important because sometimes the timeline of research and policy doesn't line up. That study I mentioned, looking at the bioregion, that was a four-year study. So research takes time and sometimes policy change happens quickly. So if we can build lasting relationships, sometimes we can merge those uh, timelines a little bit more effectively. And then also sort of getting out to events like this and talking about the relevance of the work we do outside of BC. A lot of the issues that we're tackling are relevant across Canada. So finally, I'll just say, you know, policy and regulation create the environment in which our food systems operate. If we want food systems change, we need to change policy. And advocacy and policy change should be informed by factual, factually based arguments. So from our perspective, advocates, policymakers, and researchers need to work together towards effective change in the food system.